Welcome to 60 Skills. The topic of today's discussion is profiles of successful yogic and meditative and magical practitioners. All right, this will be a bit controversial for some people, and keep in mind the number of data points available for this are quite limited, so it's largely based off of anecdotal or observation-based points. That said, as many of you know, I've been doing this work for about 20 to 30 years already, and this seems to be what most successful practitioners have in common. While I'm sure there are exceptions, I honestly haven't seen any. So let's begin. All right, what's the difference between men and women and successful practitioners? Well, as a general rule, amongst higher level practitioners, the ratio of success seems to be about one woman per every seven men, or one woman to every eight men. A variety of reasons exist for this, and we'll get to those in a moment. The universal examples of likely success are as follows. Most highly successful practitioners tend to have a starting IQ of somewhere between 115 and 130. That said, most people, once they go through Kundalini Awakening or the ability to access their own Akasha non-dual light, tend to notice an increase in their functional IQ. Whether this is a testable issue or not, I don't have a good answer to, but everybody reports being quite a bit more intelligent, generally in the area of 15 to 20 IQ points. So you take somebody who's reasonably, reasonably bright and they become very intelligent, and you take the genius and they become something extraordinary. This seems to be rather universal. All right, what else do people have in common? They have a starting age typically of below 60. I'm not saying it's impossible for someone over 60 to do this kind of work starting from the beginning, but I suspect the endocrine system production requirements are quite rare in people above that age. That said, in general, most people I've met who've shown a beginning adherence to strong training in these arts start somewhere between their late 20s and late 40s with the occasional individual starting in their early 50s. Below that, the grandmaster level people out there tend to start training quite young. However, when this happens, it seems to cost them a few inches in height that they otherwise would have genetically had from their parents. My suspicion is that whatever subtle energy goes into the growing the body gets diverted into these more subtle channels and tissues within the body. That said, people who start young tend to be quite a bit stronger than those who start later on in life. Physically speaking, you can't train hard and have excess body fat. So in men, this typically means a body fat of around 15%, and in women, less than 30%. So if you're overweight and you want to engage in serious training, you need to focus on getting your body composition in check first. Now, the method of doing this, I am largely agnostic to. Vegan, keto, low carb, extreme endurance events, whatever it takes you to get that in line, go ahead and do that. Just make sure it's sustainable for the duration of your training. Now, you often run into people who are older with a great deal of yogic skill who can be a, a little overweight. Well, that's because they've already done the work. That said, once your body composition is out of check, any progression you make is rather slow in nature, for obvious reasons. Finally, in terms of body typing, the best practitioners I've met universally fall into one of two categories. One, they're either gigantic people. In some cases, this is referred to as an earth body type. The men will usually be between 6'2 and 6'4 and weigh in somewhere between 100 and 120 kilos plus. The reason for this is simple. When you're that big and your body fat levels are in check, you have large amounts of well-developed fascia, ligament, and tendon tissue with which to run energy through the body. The other category of individual tends to be quite small and quite lithe. Their connective tissue is hyper well integrated and hyper developed. If you put your hands on them, it feels like you're touching a leather whip. The contractile tissue is well developed, it's very strong, but in their case, it's particularly well integrated. My Taoist teacher, who is one of the few human beings alive that I'm legitimately afraid of, 
stood less than five feet tall, and weighed in at about 100 pounds. And this individual had the strongest energetic ability to project of any human being I've ever met, hands down. So again, you end up with these really huge people or people with especially well-developed fascia and ligament tendon training. Now, beyond this, things get a little interesting. So we've discussed the role of raw intellect. We've discussed the difference between the genders. We've discussed the issue of body typing, and we've discussed the issue of body composition. Some people can be connected to certain kinds of egregoric reservoirs of energy. Usually this is through some magical ritual system. Those people can generate quite a bit of energy upon command and have some rather remarkable abilities. That said, if their body isn't properly structured, running that much energy through the body seems to be destructive on a variety of levels because the superstructure isn't designed to support this. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, initially, now additionally, I'll make one more comment for the ladies out there. Amongst female practitioners, I have seen two common threads that are indicators that they will succeed at the training. They either have a traditional martial arts background, and this usually applies to ladies who've trained or lived in Asia, or interestingly enough, they come from a very hardcore Western ballet system of training. Now this isn't just weekend classes. These, these women were all essentially professional or semi-professional ballerinas. But those seem to be the two common threads for women as well. And that the, A, they're far less common to train this kind of material than men. But amongst the ones who do, they either come from a very strong traditional martial arts background or a ballet background. There are a variety of thoughts that come to mind as to why this is, but that has universally been the trend I've seen amongst women. Now in the West, things like Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting, and of course MMA are becoming much more common amongst women than they ever were previously. My suspicion is someone with one of those backgrounds would do quite well additionally. And here is my final point. Amongst serious practitioners that I have met who have been ultimately successful, there is one additional universal theme that doesn't get much mention in the common literature. This is having overcome a severe trauma in life. Now, this could be involving growing up in a wartime scenario. This could be involving growing up in extreme poverty and liberating yourself from that. This can involve overcoming some kind of abuse and most commonly involves overcoming some kind of severe health crisis. And the reason for this is simple. If you're perfectly happy and perfectly healthy and perfectly wealthy and have a great family life, why would you ever pursue any of these things? While I'm sure there is an individual out there that came to this because they wanted to find God, I've never actually seen that. Everyone I've ever met who succeeded at esoterics writ large had to overcome a severely traumatizing event in their background that in turn gave them the raw will and the physical fortitude necessary to succeed. I'm not encouraging you to go out there and traumatize yourself to succeed at this stuff. I'm just saying amongst people that I know at the grand master level, this is a universal theme. So take a look at the life of the Buddha. He grew up as part of the warrior class and the son of a king. The time period that he grew up in was an extremely rough place to live. Modern agriculture, as you and I understand it, didn't exist. All the megafauna had been haunted out. People were starved most of the time. It was a period where kings, or thugs with three-foot-long razor blades strapped to the end of nine-foot-long sticks, who were mostly adolescents, ruled the world. This was a very rough place to survive in. Even the three magi who were visiting Christ from the east had to go through a very dangerous road or dangerous place to get to Jerusalem. The area was classically surrounded by banditry and basically uncontrolled by any major government. So again, if you look back at classical practitioners, this tends to hold true. So these are some things I've seen in terms of profiles of successful practitioners. 
I hope there are real exceptions to that out there. Personally, when I really got into the details behind someone who succeeded at these things, I haven't seen it. However, if you like the topic of today's discussion, please give us a like down below and consider subscribing to the channel. Additionally, if you'd like to learn more about the 60 Skills curriculum, please check out the links in the details portion of the video down below. Otherwise, train hard and be well.